Hello from Heatwave UK. We might get a bit sweaty today in the studio. We have got one of our most popular guests, podcast number eight, San Quentin Prison Shootouts and Escapes. If you've not seen it with John Abbott, it is absolutely mind blowing. And the link is in the description box below the video. The media described him as a James Bond supervillain with an IQ of 180 trained in Japanese martial arts. The people watching the video commented on how calm and cool he talks, a bit like speaking to a real life Christopher Walken. And I think it's the contrasts between the stories he told in part one and his manner that has really fascinated people and there a few quotes came in before we get to his hard-hitting stories a few quotes came in that i'd just like to run by you john and see what your um reaction is the people really focused on you saying i'm not a tough guy and i'm not an adrenaline junkie but i must say robbing drug dealers was entertaining robbing drug dealers really warmed my heart well, I, I, you wanted me to be honest, and unlike most stories you hear about crime where people feel driven to do it because of their addiction or whatever it was, I just enjoyed it. So, yeah, I mean, when I think back on it, if I, if I hadn't gone to jail, it would have been all roses, but uh, because... Uh, the actual crime part of it was a lot of fun and exciting. So, yeah. But there was a lot of the downside to that as well. If you have watched part one, in the first shootout, John loses his brother. And then in the second shootout with the Canadian cops, there's more serious injuries and fatalities in that one as well. The next quote then, intelligence is weakness. Intelligence allows you to see things from the other side. There is no other side, there is just survival side. And that was, we're talking about you staying in San Quentin prison on that one. Well, the problem is that you don't have much time to think when it kicks off. And if you're spending time thinking about what's going on, you could just go down in those few seconds. So the less time you think and the faster you react, the better shape you're going to be in because your natural instincts are the right ones. And they'll tell you what to do. <sighs> Profound words. And you just mentioned about you being clean cut and getting mistaken for being a cop. Did you have a story around that? Well, before I actually got arrested in California, um, I used to um, practice shooting. I used to go out and shoot handguns. But I didn't have much money, so I didn't want to go to an official range because you had to pay and you had to be a member. So I found a place out in the country where somebody had bulldozed a berm of sand, put up a couple of posts and strung some wire, and you could you know, put clothespin on uh, targets. So I used to shoot, go out there, and there was nobody around. And I was shooting one day, and this car pulled up, and a uh, young guy got out, maybe a year or two older than me. And uh, he just came over and he said, uh, oh, you're shooting. I said, yeah. He says, well, it's a nice guy's gun you got there, nice long barrel, uh, 357 with long barrels, about that long. And he said, is it accurate? And I said, well, as accurate as I am. He says, well, I've got a problem there. And I said, what do you mean? Oh, he said, it was this son of a bitch. Uh, a couple of days ago out at Yuba City, uh, we, were, we were after him, and uh, he made a run for the cornfield from a farmhouse. And he said, we just lit him up. He said, or we just, all of us, shotguns, pistols. He said, I went through a double loader on this guy. And he said, we clipped him, and he went down, and we just kept shooting. And I said, well, you know, why, why so, uh, so hard? He said, well, he... He dragged a hairdresser out of a hairdresser in Woodland and raped her and then cut her throat. And it hadn't been the first time. He'd been in Vacaville, and he'd done the same, same thing, served about five, six, seven years um, as the pastor's assistant, you know, 
working in the church and in the prison and got out. And uh, anyway, so I'm thinking, wow, this is, uh, this is pretty serious. And he says, so I need some more practice because uh, we hit him 13 times. I mean, they took 13 bullets and pellets out of this guy, but he didn't die. And he said, I, you know, we got to kill him dead when we got the chance. And, and he says, do uh, you, you want some bullets? And I said, well, yeah, okay. Well. And he opened the trunk of his car. He in a box. You could have, you could start World War III with it. There must have been like 5,000 rounds in this box. And he said, help yourself. And so, you know, I had to, I couldn't say no because, you know, so I filled a few times and shot a few rounds off, but I was pretty yancy about being with this guy because he obviously he thought I was a cop. And uh, the guy who, who he'd shot, um, was, his name was Reese. And so a couple of months later, I was in the Olo County Jail, and Reese was in the Olo County Jail too. No way. And this guy, he, he was worried, I guess, about what was going to happen at court. So he came up with this idea that if he, if he come, come off as a nutter, they'd send him back to Vacaville. So he started screaming to everybody during the day, castrate me, castrate me. And uh, at night, he would howl and scream. And uh, one day, the, the word went around the jail cell that um, he'd been taken off to the hospital. And what Reese had done is he'd got a HB pencil from one of the Christian volunteers, jammed it all the way up his dick, <sighs> and then broke it off five, five or so times. and ground it around. And when the guard came by for count, he just lifted, he lifted the blanket and showed him the whole bed full of blood. But he still didn't die. And they, they repaired him from that one. And uh, when I went to Vacaville, you could see him on the uh, medical side where Mr. Kane was. And he got his old job back as the uh, the helper for the priest. Who was the priest? It wasn't Tex Watson, was it? No, I don't. I think it was a civilian. Tex Watson was on the other side. Yeah. So that was a, an eye opener for me. One that a policeman would just tell somebody he didn't even know that he'd intentionally they were trying as hard as they could to kill a guy. And the only reason they stopped shooting, he told me, was because the ambulance came howling in and they couldn't just keep shooting the guy when he was down in front of the ambulance drivers. What do you think about that, watching this video? If this guy was a rapist and a throat slasher, what do you think about the kill on site action of the cops? Let us know in the comments. So the police have a, have a window of opportunity where they can have what they call court in the street. And that window is from when you, whatever the crime is, until whoever the other responders, the ambulance or the civilians show up. And in, in that little space, they can work out the justice they want, and they often do. Because they have fro um, throwaway guns and stuff, don't they? They can just plant. Yeah. Wow. So, you were talking about the conditions I experienced versus what you experienced, the cockroaches, the heat, and you said something about the noise. Well, each person has a thing that bothers them the most. Um, for me, it was the noise. I mean, I was in California and it was hot, so you got used to that. But the problem was you're up all day and you're not doing anything physical. So you got energy and then nighttime comes and you're trying to go to sleep, but there's just this cacophony of noise because people are shouting, the TV's on full blast. And in prison, your physical body is, is in prison, but the space between your ears and your head, that's the one bit of freedom you can hold on to. Did you guys not have like a 10, 10 rule? No. The TV just stayed on as, as, the, as the inmates wanted it to. And there was always somebody 
who slept during the day and stayed up all night with the TV blasting. Now, I wasn't used to it. I, when I went to bed at home, it was dark and it was quiet. And so at one point, it was about two in the morning and the TV was still blasting in the cell and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I, I just suddenly said, turn the fucking TV off. And I thought to myself, what have I done? I just thrown out a, like a challenge to anybody who likes TV. And do I sit, do I stay in my bed or do I jump up and face whatever happens? So I jumped up to try and face what happened, but I wasn't ready at all for what happened. And basically I got into a fight, which I lost so bad, you can't even consider it. Can you take us through it? Well, the problem was the guy was a fat guy. He was a great, big, fat, black Michelin man. And so I never thought, I never thought just looking at him, I wasn't, I wasn't a fighter, but I never thought I could lose to a guy that fat. It, you just step aside him and just, you know, use him as a heavy bag or something. But it didn't work like that. He had one move and he did it exactly right. We were, I was in the narrow space between the bunks and the bars trying to get to the day room, which was an open space. And he just charged straight down like a hippo. And he just threw himself on me. And I went back on the bunk. And 300 pounds of fat just enveloped me. <laughs> and I realized suddenly I couldn't move. The fat just covered every space in between me. And I'm just, I'm nailed. I, I can't do anything. Luckily, my hands were free. And so he decided to strangle me at that point because I couldn't move. So we went for the strangle, and I grabbed his wrists. And, well, you saw pictures of me. I was no great physical specimen. But luckily for me, he was dope fiend weak. I mean, he, he was a, just a straight-up dope fiend. So he spent all his time on the nod on a couch. And when it came to strangle me, he just hadn't the oomph. But I've got this great fat guy nailed me like this, trying to strangle me, big fat black guy. And his breath was so bad, his teeth were rotten. And it was absolutely disgusting, right? But we had to keep struggling until an impasse happened where he couldn't strangle me and I couldn't get him off. <laughs> could you breathe? <laughs> I could just breathe, but I couldn't. I, if I breathed too much, I might pass out because this guy was just all over me. And I was totally helpless. Anyway, so finally I said to him, hey, could you get off me, please? And he just rolled off and let go and... He went and sat down in the TV room, and I went to bed. <laughs> but, I mean, I've never lost a fight so badly. I, I wasn't even in it. But it was a really good fight for me because I learned something very important. I learned the rule, the first rule of the ghetto. And because so many people from the ghetto go to jail, it's the first rule of jail. And that is, get down first. Whatever you're doing, get down first. So, you know, in Canada, where I spent a lot of time as a kid, there was a kind of a ritual to getting into a fight. You know, we go to a party, there's a lot of alcohol around. You look at me and say, what, what the fuck are you looking at? And I say, what the fuck is it to you? And then you say, well, fuck you then. And then I say, well, fuck you too. And gradually you work yourself up to where you know there's going to be a fight. And there's, there's kind of a, a ritual to it. But in the jail, all that's gone. It just goes straight to maximum violence. So when I think back on it, that fight was the best thing that could have happened to me. Because one, I learned the first rule of, of prison in jail. And two, I didn't get hurt. <laughs> so as far as fights are concerned, that one's at the top of the pile for being a useful fight. Do you remember your next fight that you had after that one? Well, the thing is, if you get into a fight in prison, you failed. It means you haven't been playing your cards right. There's an edge where you want to be. You want to be in the edge of where you're threatening to fight or threatening violence, where the other person knows that you're good to go 
but that you don't go, that you haven't gone. Because in fights, you never know what's going to happen. You slip, fall down, and bang your head on the wall, and you're done. Now, you, you could be the best fighter in the world. It doesn't matter. That You give the guy that advantage, you're done. So all these Hollywood movies, I mean, it's just embarrassing to watch because, you know, a guy gets a tremendous smack on the jaw, jumps up, and he's good, good to fight. The fact is, you hit a guy hard like that in the jaw, one, he's got a broken jaw, two, he's on the ground, stunned, and then you just go to work on him. That's what really happens. So prison fights, if you ever get into them, are usually sucker punches, and the sucker punch nearly always wins. So whoever sucker punches the other guy, a good one, he wins. There's no five-minute fight scene where you do your Bruce Lee imitation. You know? How did you make the prisoners know that you were good to go? Well, the thing is, I realized right after that thing with the fat guy that I was totally unequipped physically. Like, I'd never taken physical training seriously. I never really been into that. And so I started a routine of working out. And basically, I discovered a secret. Working out works on two levels. One, you get physically strong and fit and healthy. And, you can, and if you have to go, you can go. But two, you get tired. And so when the night comes and they lock the doors, you can go to sleep. And that was the real one. Because what tears prisoners to pieces and the reason guys top themselves in jail is they can't get to sleep. They're in bed just churning it over, you know, why did I do this? Why did she do that? Why did he say that? He was my bro. How could he drop a dime on me? And they just tear themselves up. So you got to be able to get to sleep in prison and you got to be fit. And so I, that's where I focused. And those two came together. And so basically, Another guy might think he's a better fighter than me, but if he's watched me running around the track and lifting the weights and doing 100 and 200 sit-ups, it puts an element of doubt in his mind. Now, most prisoners, almost all of them, are not into real fitness. I don't know what you saw when you were in Arizona, but the guys that I saw, they wanted to look big. They wanted big biceps, 20-inch biceps, and they wanted huge pecs. They wanted to be like the gorilla that does a threat display. And the other ones, the little gorillas, are afraid, and they just kind of cringe and cower. And so for them, fitness was just looking big. It was like lifting the weights, buffing out. But that isn't, that isn't physical fitness. There's, there's three kinds of fitness, and that's only one kind. That's strength. Then you've got aerobic fitness, running. But there's another kind of fitness, which nobody in prison ever bothers with, except a few Mexican Chicanos on the speed bag, and that's quickness. And weightlifting actually trains you to do just one thing, which is move heavy weights slowly. I mean, so you might be really good at throwing bales of hay when you get out. But... <laughs> There was a guy I, I knew on the weight pit, and he came in on a parole violation, and he, he was a great big weightlifter, 20-inch biceps. And he told me the story. He said, you know, getting out really messed him up. And I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I went to a bar, and a guy disrespected me. He said, I threw a punch. And I threw a punch, and just the speed of throwing that punch and the weight of his bicep tore the bicep off his bone. It tore the muscle off the bone. So he had to go in for surgery for just throwing a punch in a bar because all that muscle is heavy and makes you slow. So, again, I wanted to be sure my fitness included running and quickness. So I was up for things like badminton and, and handball. In badminton in Canada, in, in the States, the Chicanos played handball. I don't know if you... A lot of Chicanos where you went, where they have handball court and... All right, they only had handball in Supermax. 
And it was hard to get access to that. Yeah, not a place you'd want to be. <laughs> so, <coughs> to give you a sense of 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 the uh, difference between fitness, um, I was at Vacaville on the reception side one summer's day, and the word came over that the other side, the medical side of the prison, were having a sports day. And so the word came that they would do something in the way of sports for the reception side. And so this uh, member of the inmate committee from the black side came over, I mean, from the, the medical side, one of the black guy, and they put up $20 canteen for a mile race. And now the, the yard at Vacaville was about three laps was a mile. And so this is a big deal, $20, $20 ducats, you know, canteen, meant something. The thing was, not a single white guy wanted to participate. So when the time came to have the race, there were, the yard was full of people, and the blacks had just covered this, this grandstand with guys, and obviously they were betting. And... There was, you know, the Chicanos and the whites. And so when you looked, the blacks were all around where the race was going to start and they were on the bandstands. And the whites, like the chimpanzees who were on the outs, they were all in the corner looking away, pretending they didn't care, right? Now, I'm talking all the tattooed heroes, right? <laughs> there they were. They're, they weren't seeing it. It was like it didn't exist, right? <laughs> and then they called for the runners, and about eight blacks went down. And then I saw these two chunky Chicanos. These guys had, you know, they were, Chicanos have kind of short legs, short stocky legs and big kind of bodies. And you could tell they weren't any runners. And it was one Indian went down and he didn't look like a runner either. And I realized that these guys were representing that if there was gonna be a race, they were going to represent La Raza. Even if they knew they were going to lose, they still went down to, to represent. And then I looked over at all the tattooed heroes and I was waiting to see who was going to volunteer from that team. Nobody, not a move. And I thought to myself, this is embarrassing, right? I mean, the blacks are going to have a race. I mean, you know, somebody who's white's got to go down there, win, lose, or draw. And so, I, I thought I'd go down, and I used to jog, but I, I hadn't run. I just used to jog around with this uh, El Salvadorian guy. And so I went down, and the race started, and everybody just took off, and I'm last, sort of chugging around. But of course, they, ran, they were running too fast because the black guys were betting money. There was serious money being laid on the different players because each black ghetto like there's Sacramento, and the Sacramento don't like Oakland, and Oakland doesn't like San Francisco. And so they, each ghetto has got their, their rep, the person that, who's running for them, and so there's, they're betting. And the Mexicans, of course, I mean, the Chicanos, they're just representing the race. Anyway, so I started picking it up a little bit, and I noticed that people were falling out, like the Indian and the Chicanos and a couple of the blacks. And I realized that these guys were done, like they were gassed. And I wasn't gassed, and I thought to myself, I might, I might be in this race. So the, the second lap started, and ahead of me there were three blacks, and all the, blacks, all the other blacks were on this bandstand there. And I thought to myself, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to have some fun here. <laughs> so I put on the heat right as I was coming up to the bandstand, I went past two of them, and then there was this one little lithe guy who was running well in front. And I'll never forget this, because I started coming up on him fast, and a guy in the bandstand yells out, Sacramento Slim, run, run, that white boy catching you. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and Sacramento Slim, he, did the, he made the mistake. Eh? He turned his head around to look, right? And of course, as soon as you do that, you're slow. And I went past him. But of course... To doing what I'd done, I actually started my run, my, my, the heat, too soon. And then it, 
and then he he was he was a runner too. He wasn't just one of these guys who was playing at it. And we went around, we ran around the clubhouse turn, right? And all of a sudden, I had like a hundred, two hundred tattooed white heroes there, all so happy to be and screaming and shouting and go, go, go. And they'd come alive, right? And we come around the corner. And I, by this time, I couldn't feel my body. I couldn't feel my feet. I was just gasping. But I know the kid behind me, he was gasping too. And I thought if I could just stumble across and I managed to, he, he came, come up to about five yards behind me and I managed to come across wow. and fell out. And so I guess that was the, the only time I really represented the, the white race. And it wasn't even, I wasn't even intending to really. I just I wanted a good, good workout. Did they have a, like a celebration for that? Well, they never paid me the twenty twenty dollars ducats. It was obviously meant for the fellas, the black fellas, who were sure that's it, and it was that's who was going to win the race. 